We can't say for sure whether this story is true. Uh, yeah, actually we can. Uh, that did not happen. <laughs> uh, the writing system was not created by a single person. It was certainly not created back in 2700 BC. She has pretty good pronunciation. What's up guys, it's Ash, and today I'm going to be reacting to a TED Ed talk called The Secret Behind How Chinese Characters Work. This video has well over a million views, so I'm curious to see what they got right and what they got wrong about the Chinese writing system. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Dr. Ash Henson, and I did a PhD in Chinese Paleography and Historical Phonology in Taiwan, which is a fancy way of saying that I do research on the origins and evolution of the Chinese writing system. I wrote my 768 page PhD dissertation in Chinese on a framework for explaining how Chinese characters actually work. So this video is right up my alley. Let's take a look at the video together and see if it's got good or bad information or if it's just spreading misconceptions like so many other videos out there. And if you're learning Chinese and want to learn how Chinese characters actually work, check out our free webinar with the top eight tips on how to learn Chinese characters. The link is in the description. Let's dive in. According to legend, in the 27th century BCE, the Yellow Emperor of China charged his historian, Cang Jie, to develop the system of writing. Sitting alongside a riverbank, Cang Jie noticed the imagery that surrounded him. From this, he created the first Chinese characters. And that night, the sky rained millet while ghosts cried, fearing their actions may now be condemned by the written word. We can't say for sure whether this story is true. Uh, yeah, actually we can. Uh, that did not happen. <laughs> uh, the writing system was not created by a single person. It was certainly not created back in 2700 BCE. That's the wrong number! <laughs> The, the writing system actually came on the scene around 1300, maybe 1500 BCE. That's way later than 2700 BCE. Yeah. But the earliest artifacts containing Chinese characters date to the Shang Dynasty, around 1250 to 1050 BCE, still making it one of the earliest forms of written language. Characters etched on ox bones and turtle shells discussing everything from agriculture to the origins of a toothache. These ancient characters were mainly pictograms, or symbols that resemble what they're meant to represent. Even today, some of the most foundational Chinese characters remain pictographic, like ren, means person, and mu, which means wood or tree. Some characters are ideograms, or symbols that represent abstract concepts, like the numbers yi, er, and sen. Well, I, paleographers don't like to use the word ideogram. That word's been used in conjunction with basically saying Chinese characters aren't related to spoken language, and that's not true. And her examples of this abstract concept, one, two, and three, if you're gonna define this type of character, there's very few of them <laughs> that are like of this type. Others are compound ideograms, which combine two or more pictograms or ideograms. For example, xiu, places the character for person next to the character for tree and means to rest. However, most modern day characters are known as logograms. Also, I just have to say I, these words, logogram, like why do people use these words? Stop it, get some help. It's like when I speak of characters in English, I make, I use words that the first time you hear them, you can get an idea of what I'm talking about. Like for instance, well, what she's talking about in Chinese, you call xing sheng zi, form, sound, character, meaning that part of the character gives, gives a hint of the meaning, part of the character gives a hint of the sound. Uh, but I would call that a, a sound meaning character, right? If you heard that, you would immediately know oh, sound meaning, but then you say logogram and like, what, what, is, what does that even mean? Characters are known as logograms, and are constructed of two components, a radical component, which gestures at the meaning of the character, and a sound component. Okay, so she stumbles on a very common issue, and that's the use of the word radical. Uh, the word radical is not a good use, it's not, it's not a good idea to use the word radical talking about character parts. The reason is there are several common things people take radical to mean. They take, well, first of all, because the word radical itself seems to indicate that, that this is one of the most basic components I can use to create another character. 
but actually not all radicals are basic in this type of sense because they might be composed of two parts. So if a character, if, the, if that component has two parts, it's not, a radical seems to indicate that it's it's only a singular thing and then you add these singular things to create character. Uh, another issue is that people can just mean the word, they can just mean component when they say radical, right? People talk about phonetic radicals. There's no such thing as a phonetic radical. Ra a radical is a, it's a basically a bad translation of the Chinese word bu shou, which means section head. And that character was the first character in the section of characters that had that component in it, right? So things called a bu shou. So it's basically a bad translation of section head, which is the head character in a section in a paper dictionary where the dictionary is arranged according to radical. So if it has the mu, like the, the tree that she was talking about, and it's a character that has tree in it, it's gonna be in that section. And the section head is just the tree thing by itself. But so, you know, part of my dissertation is I made actually a, a dictionary of basic components that give meanings, or not, not basic, but any component that gives a meaning to another character. And there's like 600, over 600 of these things. And there's 214 radicals in the Kangxi radical list. So clearly there are more meaning components or semantic components than there are radicals. So radicals cannot equal semantic component. And in modern Chinese, the most common 4,000 characters, uh, the radical is points you the way to the semantic meaning of the character 65% of the time. Now you gotta think to yourself, if I had a friend who, when I asked them for directions, was only correct 65% of the time, would you keep asking them for directions? like? I mean, that means if you ask them for a hundred times, 35 of those times, you're gonna have to, you're gonna get lost. <laughs> so like, you know, you want a more reliable indication of meaning, and that is looking at semantic components. Which hints at its pronunciation. And all characters are built from a variety of strokes, which are often simplified to eight basic types. There are 214 radicals, each with its own definition. Some can stand alone, while others cannot. For instance, the radical ru written on its own means a son. It's also used in care. I mean, it's not entirely wrong, but this, it's not a radical written on its own. It's actually just a character that also acts as a radical sometimes. Characters with son related definitions, such as xiao, meaning dawn. The radical- I will say she has pretty good pronunciation. She's nailed her tone so far with that. So that, that's actually kind of different from other videos where they slaughter the pronunciation. <laughs> Beijing. She's actually doing a really good job. And just a quick note, this is not a right or wrong thing, but how many sound components are there in Chinese writing? It depends on the set of characters you're looking at. Most people are gonna be interested in the what's pertinent today if I'm learning characters. So if I'm learning characters, we look at the most common 4,000 characters, right? But there's, you know, and how many characters actually exist, that's a philosophical question that we can't answer in this video, but it's above 80,000. Uh, though nobody nobody learns anywhere near that amount of characters. Anyway, the number of sound components obviously is going to change. If I look at the most common 4,000 characters versus the most common 40,000, there's going to be a radically different uh, number of sound components. While many words in Chinese sound similar, just like in other languages, context or tonality helps clarify their meaning. Yet how each character is pronounced depends on dialect, which varies across the country. So conversation... Well, I mean... That's sort of true and sort of not true. I mean, if you're the, the Chinese government does not want people pronouncing characters in dialect. They want them pronouncing it in Putonghua. The fact that they sound different in different dialects is not really related to characters. It's more related to spoken language and that, that the various Chinese dialects have similar morphemes or the same morphemes, but they're just pronounced differently in Chengdu may sound vastly different than in Nanjing, but in both places, the written language is the same. The Chinese writing system has undergone many changes. As characters went from being etched in bone to cast in bronze to brushed on paper. Yeah, and this is not a progression like that. The Shang, who were, which, which is the dynasty when characters were invented, uh, very likely wrote on bamboo strips. Uh, none of them have survived up until now, but like the character for like Ce, the character for volume is a bunch of bamboo strips of the uh, some kind of binding that's tying them together so they, they wouldn't have invented that character if they weren't using bamboo strips 
So they were using bamboo strips, but they also riding on turtle shells for purposes of divination. Uh, they also had bronzes and the same time they're riding on all of these things. So it wasn't that they rode on one medium first and then rode on another medium next and then another one. They, they, most of the time they were riding on all of them and for different reasons at the same time period. In the 1950s and 60s, the Chinese Communist Party introduced new simplified versions of the traditional characters, which are now yeah, they didn't introduce new. I mean, they did, but I think it was like three new characters. And even those they didn't invent, they were invented in the Tian Guo. I forgot the name of the, it was a revolution that had happened, you know, 100 years prior, 150 years prior. But, but what they actually did was they went through uh, historical ways of writing and chose more simple, not meaning easier, meaning with less strokes. So they found character forms that were the same character, variants of the same character with less strokes. And then they compiled these and then chose which ones they wanted. So they didn't actually introduce new characters. Rather, they were kind of reintroducing old characters. Chinese characters have and will continue to leave their mark. So, you know, just general thoughts, like I know it might seem kind of nitpicky, but it actually, if you want to learn characters, if you're not, if you're just interested because you don't know anything about characters and you just want to spend 20 minutes on it and then move on, then none of the stuff I said probably makes a difference at all. But if you actually want to learn characters and you want to understand how they work, which is in your interest if you want to learn them, then understanding how they actually work makes a big difference. Because if you learn by understanding how characters actually work, you will very quickly develop an intuition for how sound and meaning is represented within a character. And that's actually what the whole character game is about. How, how does it represent sound? How does it represent meaning? And understanding the rules for that allows you long-term recall. Like you can remember these things years later because you, you can go through and use your understanding of how that character might represent its sound or meaning and pluck your memory strings to see if you've learned this character before. And I, you know, I do this all the time. So this, that actually works. Uh, also this intuition, you look at a character and you already kind of know what it means and what it might, well, what it might mean and what it might sound like. And you gotta imagine if I'm learning characters and I can understand what it probably sounds like and what it probably means, aren't I, gonna, aren't I in a much better position to learn that character than if I'm just somebody and I look at it and it's just a bunch of meaningless strokes? Yeah, of course, right? And if you want to learn characters that way, we actually have a dictionary that's based on these principles. We also have a character course uh, for Chinese and a kanji course for Japanese. Uh, the most basic concepts you need to make your learning the most meaningful and effective. So we have those things available. And then we're also going to come out with a paleography course on the 15th of April. I think it's already available for purchase, but it starts on the 15th of April and that will teach you, that's if you're like interested in ancient Chinese and you want to like look at these forms and have some idea what you're looking at. And uh, yeah, it's a very interesting course. And if you if you love characters like I do, you know, if, if I didn't already have a PhD in paleography, I'd probably take it myself. <laughs> but uh, anyway, there's some links to these things in the description so you can check that out. If not, we got a ton of videos you can check out and blog posts. All right, this is Ash, see ya.